get started with our next presentation. It is Izzy Coffin, and she is presenting Disability Across the Rainbow. Um, I think she's going to leave some time for questions at the end. Please be sure you have the microphone in your hand before asking the question. Um, and if you need me, I will be in the corner over here. And I'm going to turn it over to Izzy. Okay, hi everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit emotionally exhausted after watching a presentation on eugenics, which was very informative, but it's also like talking about erasure of our people, so it's kind of like hard just to, to transition from that. Um, but I'm Izzy, I'm from Philly. I'm a disability activist and educator and sexuality educator and just a mishmash of things. And I do whatever I can and I get random consulting jobs and whatever happens, happens. Um, so, oh, and my pronouns are they, them. I'm definitely part of the queer community and that's what we're talking about mostly today. <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to take like one minute to just decompress, take a deep breath, and just be. So if you feel comfortable closing your eyes for like 10 seconds, go for it. I'm just going to take a moment. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick content warning because I'm talking about some things that might be a little bit hard to talk about. Um, and, you know, if you need to take care of yourself, leave the room, whatever you need to do, um, totally up to you. Uh, we're going to talk about AIDS and HIV, a little bit about pornography, ableism, a little bit about eugenics, homophobia, um, sexuality in different ways and identity. So, I was born with HIV. It was something that I, my mother got from a blood transfusion from, like, blood back then wasn't really filtered, so it was just a mistake. Um, and for me, I think growing up, having HIV and also a physical disability made things very confusing in my life. And, like, I didn't really know what my identity was. Um, sorry, my stopwatch just stopped. Okay. So I just wanted to go through some of the messages that I received about growing up and about what my body was. Because I think that at, when you're disabled, a lot of people are telling you things about your body. And if they make it something that maybe it's not, or that we grow up with these messages and we need a chance to actually form them ourselves. So I have, I have CP and I had ankle surgery in fourth grade to lengthen my Achilles tendons because I would walk on my tippy toes and I could run and walk on my tippy toes and it was pretty awesome, I liked it. And then one day they were like, you know what? We need to fix this. This is clearly an issue. And I feel like I never really consented to the surgery. Is like I was expected to just go along with it and be okay with my body changing in a very rapid way. And I was like in a wheelchair for the first time in my life. And I had two like really big casts on my legs. And it was kind of a strange time because I'm going through school and everyone wanted to help me all the time. Like everyone wanted to push me around and like deep down I knew that I didn't like it but I couldn't voice it at the time. And it was almost like I was infantilized for having those, those casts on and for being in a wheelchair. It was like more of a, I don't know, People treated me so differently after that. It was like I was completely separate from who I, I knew I was inside. And like, then after that, it was all about how can we cure it? How can we get Izzy to start walking, um, to walk 
normal, whatever that means. We're not here to talk about anything. There's no real normal, right? It's all spectrum. Anyway, um, so I like went through physical therapy and have physical therapists telling me what to do. Have my parents telling me that you should stretch all the time or having to take new pills that I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what they were actually doing, but I had a lot of side effects from them. And then there, that same time was I got very sick with AIDS and I was diagnosed with AIDS and I was having to, I was hearing these messages from people in the HIV community telling me, don't let, you know, HIV define you. You know, you should be, you should be like motivated to get better. You should be motivated to do this, to do that, whatever it is. And it's, it's contradicts itself and it's ableist because it's not about motivation. It's about just getting through it and living. And yeah, I could talk about that all day, honestly, motivation. Um, and then the body, that my body, people had opinions about it. Like people were constantly telling me about it and I could never form my own opinions. It took a very long time, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but I was, I was pushed to use crutches a lot, and I still do. And I was praised for using the crutches and for walking around. And if I got in my wheelchair, it was again like, oh, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> um, and then, but at the same time, if I wanted to push myself in the wheelchair, it was weird because I was supposed to allow other people to push me around. So there's like a lot of contradictions that I got as a child growing up and I just, what was I supposed to do? I had like nobody else to talk to about it. And that's why I'm so excited that I'm here right now. <laughs> um, and then like being an inspiration, going around my middle school and I, and I refused to use the elevator. And I would never do that now because access is really important to me and not how other people see me. But at the time, I was like trying to be as able passing as possible. I was like, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be running, I'm gonna be walking, I'm not gonna use the elevator, like I'm not gonna be separated from my friends. I don't wanna aid at school, even though I think looking back on it, it probably would have been a really good idea and it would have saved me a lot of energy and time. And then this, um, you know, you're a burden if you don't try and you're still a burden if you do because your body is just the way that it is and we can't do anything about it. <laughs> so I also received a lot of messages about sex because we're, our culture is very odd about sex. It's like we want to talk about it, but only in like a heteronormative, like, in a, in a way where there's two different kinds of genitalia that fit together and that it has to have romance involved and I'm just not interested in that at all and it took me a while to figure that out. But um, one of the big things I think I received, even though I was supposed to be empowered with HIV, being in those spaces and having my parents tell me that and then for a while I think I was scared of, being intimate with someone. I was scared of, of like wanting to touch somebody because I thought I would kill them. <laughs> and even in like, this was in the 90s, so there was more education about HIV, but it was still not really, it wasn't really there and it still isn't there today. Um, but yeah, I was afraid I would kill somebody. So I waited for a very long time before my first sexual debut. I don't use the term virginity because virgin, virginity is like a whole other concept that could be in a whole nother talk. Um, but, and then there was the, also the idea that you could pass HIV on to a baby, which is what happened to me. And I thought that that was the worst thing in the world, that I would be, that I could never have kids. And, now I have a doctor who is amazing and I've never had a doctor who's actually listened to me about like my disability and about HIV and she, she's telling me like, yeah, you can have a baby and maybe you will pass it on but there's such a low risk of that now and we know that thanks to science. 
Science is very helpful. And then I was a very curious child, and I did watch a lot of porn. And I was, I mean, being in middle school, we had the internet. We had computers in our rooms. So I was very curious, and I looked up sex positions. And when I watched, like, mainstream porn, all of the positions that they were doing, I thought that that wasn't allowed for me. Or, like, I thought because I saw only female and male that this whole part of sexuality was just not accessible to me. Or that there, there's just no representation of other bodies. I mean, now it's getting better, but you still have to generally have to pay for that kind of content if you want something actually really good. Um, so I kind of saw all these sex positions and I thought, well, that's just impossible. Also, who would want to have sex with me anyway because my body doesn't work normally, so why would that happen? And then, I think I talked about some of these already, but like I, I, was, I internalized the idea that I would be lucky to find somebody. Not that they would be lucky to find me, but that I would be like swept off my feet by somebody who would just take care of me and just, you know, get me motivated to get better and walk all the time. And that's just not, that, it took me a very long time to unlearn that. I think that's what I'm trying to say. That's what this whole thing is about, is about all the messages that I'm like trying to unlearn. And I'm still trying to do it now because disclosing that I have HIV is still a really scary thing to me. And, but I, then I realized, but like, is that my own internalized stigma or is that stigma that is coming from outside? I mean, it's both, but I know in this space that it's safe to do so. Um, and then, I mean, I, I didn't think of myself as beautiful or as desirable because I didn't have any representation. And like, I, I mean, I didn't see any people who really looked like me or who were queer in magazines who, like their gender identity was ambiguous. I didn't really see that. <laughs> And I wish I did, but now I can find it anytime I want. Um, and then lack of messages around like masturbation and pleasure for female people. Like, I mean, men typically in society are told that they have to be ready for sex at all times and that they always want it and that they should have a lot of orgasms and, you know, spread their seed, whatever. And so I obviously... I was born female, and I mean, I'm non-binary now, but growing up as a female and having to navigate that society and thinking, well, maybe I'm not supposed to feel pleasure during sex. Maybe it's just supposed to hurt. I don't know. So I think that was another thing I had to unlearn. And obviously, it's all false. <laughs> like, we're not, you know, like all those messages that we receive about disability and about like in, invisible illness and being queer. It's like we're in our, like, I think Sandy might have said it earlier that we were in a bubble, or Mia, that we're in like a bubble right now and that we go out there and we have to advocate for ourselves and we have to figure out what does it mean like to be disabled and to have all these identities and not to let society like ingrain those those thoughts, so. So some of what I do in, to combat a lot of those messages is to find and meet other disabled people. It's just, it's really important. I need to find my community. I didn't start doing that until I was in my 20s and my early 20s. And I really wish I had started earlier. I really wish I had known that this, like these kinds of spaces were starting you know, the seeds were planted for a long time. Um, and then I also try to, I feel like I'm still infiltrating queer spaces. Like, I don't feel like I'm really allowed in them still, because I think there's more of an effort being made, at least in Philly. I mean, I see that there's accessible bathrooms that are available outside and things like that, but it still feels like like I don't belong and I'm, I'm constantly like educating people about it and it's emotionally exhausting 
Like I went to this one queer women's meeting at a um, LGBTQ center and I was telling a person about my life and about that I work within an independent living center. And then the person asked me, oh, so do you live there? Like, do you live in that center? And I'm like, no, I work there. <laughs> Why are you making that assumption? You know, it was just so strange. Or like being out with my friends and we're all physically disabled and people are asking us if we all live together, you know? It's like, do you, do you live together? Like, it's such an odd question. <laughs> and then like people still in these queer spaces asking about my disability right away not trying to get to know me as a person first, but like, like just going straight for why are you in a wheelchair? I need to know this right now because I can't you know, understand you without having to know this very important information. So sometimes I lie and I say I was in like a shark attack or I, you know, <laughs> I climbed up a mountain, who knows? There's a lot of potential for that. Um, and then, Oh, do I have enough time? How much time do I have? Oh, okay. Okay, I'll do one more minute. Um, so I also educate mostly non-disabled people or able-bodied people about disability, like disability history, disability rights, and I work for a very small organization and we're grant funded by the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council. And we're writing lesson plans for kids that are about disability rights and disability history and, and the language of disability and we're still like advocating to get it into schools. And I think it's hard for that non-disabled population to see this as useful for kids because they, they're more concerned about how are we gonna get, um, I don't like the term special needs but they use it all the time. So they're, they're thinking how do we get these special needs kids to be more included? when maybe it's more like the whole school needs to just get rid of their stigma about disability. So it's, it's hard. Um, and yeah, I think that's it actually. Does anyone have any questions? Networks with women with disabilities, um, but as well as non binary. Oh, it's not awesome. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, I guess I have to start again, right? Yes? Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm looking at you because you were the one that said use the mic. Um, so thanks, Izzy, <laughs> for sharing because it's really um, interesting how things are similar between um, Philly and Montreal and other places in Canada that I know. Um, I would like to hear maybe a little bit more about, you talked about like those lessons learned for kids with disabilities because something that I struggle, like I'm, I work for a really long time in a girl serving organization, is noticing how like there's no, there's nothing for kids with disabilities that doesn't come from their mm -hmm. parents who have their best interests at heart. And I say that in quotation, because sometimes it's about like them fitting in or like they don't want to talk about sex or sexualities or like actually having a disability, mm -hmm. which I, not a parent, so maybe I don't fully get it, but I, I'm always wondering how can we best support actually youth with disabilities when they're like actually no, there's very little people working directly with them, and they're also segregated often in those so-called special education. Yeah. So if you want to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, how you do that, because I find that's really amazing. Well, I, it's hard. So you're asking about like teaching them about sexuality? Or just anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it would be best to just try to get disability activists to come talk or something, people from the same identity. I think that would be best. Um, I, I honestly don't have a lot of uh, advice for teaching disabled kids because I mostly talk to non-disabled people. <laughs> and I'm like, I would love to teach uh, disabled kids too. Um, but I think a lot of the time I'm expected to work for free 
for organizations, you know, or like they reach out to me and they want disability awareness and they don't really want it. They, they're like, we don't have a budget for it. We don't have a budget. I'm like, that's bullshit. You know you do and you just don't want to pay me. <laughs> and so that's another thing. I mean, if you're going to bring disabled activists in, you probably have to comp them for something. Yeah, I think that's a long line of oppression is that people of color, people with disabilities, and queer people are expected to speak about their experiences for free. And that's something I talk about a lot on social media, I think, because I think people just need to know about it. And if you work in a nonprofit, you probably already know about this. But yeah, any other questions? So I want to thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate it and resonated with a lot of what you said. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you used to have a lot of negative, because you hear so much negativity from the world about your own body and the sexuality, et cetera. I'm transgender and in a wheelchair as well, and I'm trying to unlearn a lot of the things that you, you said to yourself that people would be lucky to, like, I'd be lucky to find someone else versus vice versa, um, or feeling like a burden. How did you start the process of unlearning that? Because I'm really struggling with that right now. Um, I've been disabled, like I'm autistic and other things, but the physical disability just started after a medical error in 2017, so I'm adjusting to that, and I've already noticed that people drastically treat me differently. So how did you start to unlearn those things? Hanging out with disabled people is the, my best mm. suggestion. That's true. Uh, yeah, I think, because I was very isolated, and then I went to grad school for human sexuality studies, because I knew deep down that like I wanted to unlearn all this stuff, and I wanted to teach people how to do it. and. So that opened me up to meeting somebody who made this like sh very short pornographic film about a girl with a crutch and she masturbates with it and it's amazing. Uh -huh. And I saw that I was like, oh my God, I have to meet this person. So it kind of was just like a chain reaction. So I think you being here today is like part of how you can do that. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry, we actually have to uh, get ready for the next presenter, but I want to thank Izzy, and um, I'm sure you'll be able to take questions in the back if you're interested. Yeah. If you're able. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.